that. So this uh, presentation is about um, poster presentation best practices. Um, my name is Kuva Glazik. I'm a methodology expert at the Los Angeles campus. And uh, I've uh, presented a number of different conferences, um, both as, uh, as posters and as talks, um, as well as published uh, research in peer-reviewed uh, journals. So uh, a lot of what I'm going to present to you today is based on my experience, um, but a lot of it is also based on uh, not my own work, but also what I've seen at conferences and also reading up on um, best practices from uh, different fields and what they recommend in terms of um, putting together poster presentations. So uh, if you have any questions, just um, chime in via the chat box uh, or you can uh, chime in via the, uh, uh, the audio features. So um, to get started here, um, just a little bit of an outline of, uh, of what I actually want to talk to you about specifically. Um, the uh, uh, background that I bring to the table I've already discussed a little bit. Um, some background about what the, the, the big picture sense of uh, scholarship and career goals uh, are, how they, how they factor into presenting a poster, um, and furthermore, once we cover that, I hope it'll motivate um, a little bit more of a, a perspective on what this is all about, sort of um, an overview of that. And what you can expect at conferences, external conferences, and you know, poster presentations are one type of presentation that, um, that are out there. So uh, I want to give a little bit of background on that. Uh, for those who maybe have never attended an external conference, just a little bit of um, you know, information on that. Um, and then finally, the meat and potatoes of this presentation about how to really design uh, the content uh, and uh, layout of your slide, um, and also technical tips using PowerPoint, um, which is a very handy tool to uh, uh, put together a poster with, um, as we'll see. And then finally, a little bit about um, funding for external conferences that may be of interest to some folks, so stick around. Um, so, okay, like I said, a little bit of background about me. I've made several conference presentations. I've won some awards for, uh, for my posters. Um, and I also forgot to mention this, but I do review uh, conference submissions. So um, I, I have the perspective of, uh, of that as well, knowing what um, reviewers look for in terms of uh, submissions. Uh, at this point, we're going to assume that you've already had your presentation uh, accepted, so we're not going to worry too much about um, uh, submissions of abstracts, which is you know the first step um, before you actually have your presentation accepted. Um, for those of you who are in attendance, I, I wouldn't mind knowing if uh, if you've had your poster accepted at the graduate research form. If you want to type that in, um, that would be uh, good for me to know. Um, if you're if you're willing, anyway. Uh, if not, no big deal. Um, so, like I mentioned. The importance of scholarship uh, in terms of uh, how a poster presentation factors into sort of career goals. Um, first of all, you get, by, by presenting a poster, you get um, experience in your chosen field. And what I mean by that is not, you know, by virtue of having uh, worked with clients or had, you know, such and such coursework or, um, you know, all kinds of different uh, field experience. I'm talking about uh, something that you can put on your um, CV and say, look, this is something that I'm an expert in because I've presented on it. You know, that, that implies that I've done all the research, uh, all the background reading, and um, I understand what's going on in this field. And look, here's, here's the area of focus, right? Because, because your CV would have a line that says that you presented on a specific topic. Um, so that never hurts, certainly. Um, and there's also this concept that, that's more sort of like a mastery goal as, a, as opposed to an uh, accomplishment goal, which is that uh, by presenting, you are maintaining your expertise. You're, you're keeping abreast of the trends, um, and you're, you're handing down that information to people who come and see your poster, right, so that they can get educated, so that you can talk with them and um, sort of keep the, the, uh, the scholarship train running, as it were. Um, and then, of course, you can get continuing education credits. Sometimes at certain conferences, you can uh, uh, get those 
um, by virtue of discussing things with people, attending workshops, things of that sort, and um, presenting posters is one of those things that you can do. Um, and also competitiveness. This goes back to career goals a little bit, um, but what experience sets you apart? If somebody has a choice of going to one person versus another, um, what really puts you head and shoulders above the competition, so to speak? Uh, and certainly having um, some scholarship under your belt is not going to hurt you at all. It will set you apart in the sense of having those academic credentials of being um, able to demonstrate your, your expertise. Um, and then, of course, networking. Um, what can you do for slash with someone? Somebody comes to your poster and says, oh, I'm working on a similar topic. We should talk because I've been having this problem. How have you, uh, you know, addressed it or maybe you're not aware of it and maybe we can sort of, sort of work together to, to solve a, a specific problem. Um, so the, the idea is, you know, finding people with common interests, um, understanding that is a pretty big way to um, help you develop your professional network. Uh, so certainly not something to be underestimated. Um, Okay, so let's look a little bit more closely at this idea of expertise. You want to be known as an expert by experts. So that certainly doesn't uh, mean that if you don't go to a conference, you won't get this, but it's just another avenue to um, gain that expertise and be recognized as someone that folks can come to for uh, you know, that niche that you're becoming an expert in. And also it helps get referrals. If you're working on a project, um, in let's just say applied behavior analysis where you're presenting a particular intervention, somebody comes to your post and says, oh, you know, I've been trying to, um, you know, work on the same kind of issue. Maybe I could have, uh, you know, some folks who could come to you and, uh, and that way you can get referrals. Um, so that's also another uh, benefit of presenting at a conference. Now, um, it, it certainly is, uh, you know, something easy to say, right? But there's actually um, uh, research that backs this up, that patients actually uh, rely on their social networks in seeking treatment. So um, folks who have heard of you can then pass that information on to potential patients, and then they can uh, seek you out. So um, certainly that is, uh, you know, something to, to really consider because the, the GRF has a, uh, the graduate research form for those who are presenting there, um, are going to have one kind of audience. But then if you go to an external conference, there's a lot more um, external folks who show up. And uh, from that perspective, you can definitely get involved with um, uh, this idea of networking in a, a more detailed and in-depth way. Um, all right. So presenting at a conference, as I kind of mentioned, it's, it's a means to achieve all of these different uh, uh, professional um, and uh, scholastic goals. So you can learn about relevant topics, first of all. You attend different sessions and conferences. You learn from experts, learn from colleagues. This applies to internal conferences like the GRF, as well as external conferences. Again, you can network with other experts to gain insight and learn about career opportunities. Right? There are always um, folks who have information about uh, different centers, You know, who's looking to place folks, et cetera. Um, and you also get to disseminate scientific findings. You, you are the expert. By virtue of presenting, now people, and, and this might be a little bit daunting, like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm just getting started in this, right? But um, if you're doing uh, high quality work, um, you will have insights that other people who are interested in these topics will not have. So um, it's not that you're the, all, the be all, end all uh, guru on an entire area of inquiry, no, but you are going to be the expert on your specific niche that you are presenting on. Um, and of course, um, that, again, makes you an expert. Uh, and of course, lastly, there is this idea of bolstering your CV slash resume. Um, again, in terms of developing that expertise, uh, having that stuff there in black and white um, is, of course, very uh, important to demonstrating that you do have expertise. So um, to do all this effectively, I should note that um, none of this will work if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. So networking and disseminating scientific findings kind of 
begs the question of who's going, who, who are you going to be interacting with, right? And you have to pick the right venue uh, at which to present. And I'll talk a little bit about that towards the end of the, conf uh, the conference, uh, towards the end of this presentation, um, looking at how to sort of find the right external conference, if that's something that you're interested in. Okay, so uh, next up, I just want to very quickly cover the different types of presentation formats that exist at conferences. Um, this photo here in the top right, that's an individual talk. You see that there's a person presenting up at the top. There's a, uh, a screen for um, uh, slides to be presented and uh, an audience. Um, one thing I should also note is that if you're going to be presenting at the online GRF, um, then this is really uh, more closely resembling what you could do. There are two options that you have that I'll go over, one of which is that you actually present a poster um, on a slide and you talk about your study. The other is that you just have multiple slides as though it were kind of uh, a talk. Um, but we'll look at that in more detail later. Anyway, this down here on the bottom right is an example of a poster session. You can see that there are tons and tons of posters arranged in rows. Uh, and, and there's a presenter and folks are just kind of milling around um, looking at interesting uh, stuff and talking to the presenters. So um, this is where uh, the, the, the rest of the talk will focus, but there are still a couple of other types that I want to mention, which is, first of all, colloquium or symposium and a panel discussion. And a colloquium is where a related series of talks are given sort of back to back in maybe 10 or 15 minute uh, uh, presentations that are followed by Q&A. And this is designed to sort of present a consensus or identify the state of knowledge in a certain area. So there will be you know, three or four related talks on a specific topic and folks will then um, ask questions and, and come to a consensus about where that particular area of inquiry is currently. Um, and then a panel discussion is really more where you kind of present a bit of a debate. Um, so there's more interactivity, there's more Q&A, um, and, and people are uh, invited as experts to be on the panel to discuss uh, you know, in, in more detail the kinds of issues that are going on currently. Um, which is more distinct from a colloquium or symposium where it's more of a presentation of information as opposed to a presentation of, um, you know, like a thought process or an ongoing uh, back and forth uh, Q&A kind of uh, format. Okay, so um, depending on what conference you're applying to, you can submit, make a submission and uh, have it accepted as any one of these four different types of um, uh, presentations. So depending on the, the specific conference, you're going to have different options. So for example, at the GRF, uh, we're only doing posters, right? But at a, a much larger conference, you can, you know, choose to select which of these different types you would want to um, uh, use as a format for presenting. So keep that in the back of your mind if you are going to be presenting externally. Um, now, of course, it, it mentions that you've got this, uh, the, this process of peer review, right? Any conference that is worth its salt will have uh, reviews performed and uh, the same applies to the GRF, right? Where um, you get feedback from reviewers about how you can improve the presentation or sometimes what happens is depending on uh, the quality or the fit to the conference, um, it may actually be rejected. Now, um, that's again why it's important to pick the right conference. At the GRF, uh, there is typically a high acceptance rate, um, but we uh, always want to keep this in the back of our minds. Is, you know, just because you want to present doesn't mean that it will be accepted. Um, so it's always important to, to do your best and put together a good um, submission. We're not going to be worried too much about submissions in this talk, um, but again, it's the first step, so it's, it's kind of important to note. And going into the future, um, it will be important for those who, again, plan to uh, present at external conferences. So look at poster sessions more specifically. Um, usually uh, a poster session lasts one to two hours um, and during that time you can see from these photos uh, what you can kind of expect as a presenter. You're, you're sitting there, well really standing there uh, is more like it, um, basically talking to folks who stop by and they express interest in your work and you just kind of do what's called walk them through your work. Um, and, you know, it says that it's highly interactive, and this is very true. The idea is that the poster is more of a visual aid. 
So you're sitting there interacting with these folks in real time, and you can talk about your results, you can talk about the background, you can talk about the implications, um, and the poster is really there to serve as backup. You don't want to be reading from the poster, but what you can see in all of these, what do they have in common, right? Every one of these presenters is pointing at their poster, right? So um, you should be well versed in the material so you can point to a certain figure, you can point to a certain uh, uh, graph or a piece of information and say, you know, this is what I'm referring to when I, when I talk to you about this particular idea. And then people can see the visual aid and if you're sort of highlighting a particular effect that you observed um, or an expected pattern of results, um, having that visual aid in the background there is helpful to double check that what you're saying is actually uh, what the, uh, the audience is uh, taking away from what you're saying so that you have good communication going. And this note is different from a paper, right? A paper would have all of this detail spelled out, you know, in prose, um, and, and folks would read it, right? But that's a different kind of interaction than what we see in a poster session. So um, that's a bit of uh, background on how to kind of um, present this. And for first timers, you know, you'll find your style. You will have during those one or two hours, you can expect at least a couple of different rounds of different folks uh, coming through and, uh, and you have a chance to kind of develop your style, so to speak, um, as you go. So don't worry if you kind of stumble the first time. Um, it's always a good idea, in fact, to present this to a couple of friends or family members or what have you um, to kind of get more comfortable with, with how to do this. Um, and certainly, uh, it's important to note that this is uh, typically an overview. You'll have maybe two, three, five minutes to, to walk somebody through a poster. And then within that time, they're also asking questions and, you know, you can go off on tangents, what have you. Uh, so again, it's different from a paper in that because you're not linearly presenting everything the way that a pa in a paper you would. Um, again, by virtue of it being interactive, you have the opportunity to um, uh, to talk about things in a more general way that, and, and also more specific to the questions that people pose to you. So um, it is a unique form of presenting. Now, um, the, the next uh, part of this presentation is going to be about design guidelines. So um, I want to pause here, see if there are any questions. Um, if not, we can move uh, right along. But uh, let me just pause there and see if there are, in fact, any questions. All right, let's keep going. So um, the first thing is I'm going to start with what to avoid. Uh, and then we'll move into what to actually do instead of what to avoid. So uh, it's one thing to say, OK, don't do this. But great, that leaves a whole you know, realm of possibility for what you can do. So we'll, we'll cover both sides of that coin. Um, you want to avoid over-relying on text. You can see two examples over here on the left. This is kind of what you want to avoid. It's, it shouldn't be too text-heavy. Um, you want to avoid having a lack of figures and tables. You want to have, again, those visual aids where you can point to things and say, this is what I'm describing. Um, avoid a lack of visual flow, meaning that you don't want everything to be kind of jumbled. And we'll look at examples of that. And you want to avoid distracting visual effects. Um, everything should be nice and clear. Uh, a background should be a background, not a distraction. Um, and there's uh, actually a really good template that uh, the Chicago School has put together for um, formatting a poster. So uh, I'll, I'll get more in detail about that later. But these are just for now guidelines, right? So avoid having these issues. Um, and uh, when we're talking about visual flow, for example, um, I may have misspoken, but this one's down here on the bottom you see that it has a skew of figures on the right, but not much going on on the left, right? So you've got these kind of two triangular areas that are um, preventing this, this kind of visual flow a little bit. Um, also, beware of contrast issues. Um, hopefully, these examples speak for themselves, uh, where over here, you've got what's called a low contrast situation, a dark dark text over dark background. Um, here, you've got um, colors that are kind of grading when you um, put them against each other. And then these other examples, 
uh, serve to show you know high contrast, but it depends on uh, you what you think works best to some extent. Again, there is a template that I'll show you that you should be using for um, uh, at least external conferences where you I, you kind of identify the um, uh, the format with a certain school. So uh, it, it's almost like a like a flag, if you will, that where you show that okay, look, all these posters are formatted the same. Oh, you know, somebody's walking around the conference like, oh, I recognize this format from before. Oh, it's the Chicago school. Look, they're doing similar kinds of stuff. Or, you know, it kind of um, alerts people to that fact. So you have some leeway, but again, it's important to avoid certain issues that uh, that you may not be aware of in terms of contrast specifically. Okay, so here's an example of things to avoid, right? Um, hopefully, you're seeing that there's you know a distracting background. Um, there's uh, a bunch of different text boxes that seem to be more or less all over the place. Um, there's a lot of a lot of text, right? Everything is written out in full prose. Um, and there's just, you know, it, it's just a hot mess, more or less. Um, so there's uh, one other thing that I want to point out, that um, there's this idea of lack of flow, right? You go from the abstract here to the introduction here, then you go up to materials and methods and results, and then, and then circle back around to the left for conclusion. So all these things are different sizes, different shapes, and they don't really go in, in like, um, a more or less logical order, right? Where you want to start with the abstract, move into the introduction, um, and then have uh, results and conclusions towards the end, right? Whereas um, conclusions here are going back to the left, and it's like, okay, well, what's going on there? All the text boxes are not aligned, so on and so forth. So you don't really know where to go next. Um, a lot of the time, what you'll see is at a conference, folks will just show up and then stare at your poster. And then you're standing there like, uh, what do I do? The thing to do is to say, OK, let me know if you have any questions. Um, but then also uh, a, a highly sort of experienced conference attendee at one point will say, OK, can you walk me through this? Or, or, or they'll point at something and say, OK, can you explain this to me? And then that's your cue to kind of jump in and do that bit of a walkthrough, do that interactive kind of presentation that I mentioned earlier. Um, and with something like this, you know, they're going to be staring at it and just being like, what am I, where do I start, <laughs> right? So um, let's flip it on its, uh, uh, on its head and say, what should you be doing, right? I've talked a little bit about what to avoid, but now let's look at what to actually do, right? Um, so focus on figures and tables. This is a very important point because you want to have that background information that you can point to. And again, it is just that background, right? Um, the second piece, visual flow at, with an axis of symmetry. So you'll notice there are two things here. This one up here, this example up top, has this vertical line here because it's symmetrical around that axis, right? So you've got some figures on the left, some figures on the right, and um, it presents this kind of nice arrangement. Similarly, you can have a diagonal axis of symmetry, and I'll show you an example of that. Um, and that provides for you know, uh, uh, an expectation that, um, that viewers will have of seeing figures arranged in a nice way. Um, and the text itself, instead of being prose, right? You, you can take prose from a paper that you've written and just directly copy paste it into a post and say, OK, good, I'm done, and that's it. But um, the text should provide only the absolutely necessary information that the uh, viewers will need to um, extract meaning and understanding from your uh, description. And so a good way to do that is by using bulleted lists of, for example, results or backgrounds. It doesn't matter what section you're talking about. Um, bulleted lists are a great way to very quickly summarize information. It allows you to remove unnecessary prose. It allows you to then make the font bigger um, so that you know, someone doesn't have to be like, you know, really scrunching up close to see what you're doing. They can very quickly look at what's going on, and then they can say, OK, can you answer this question for me, that question for me. Um, and then, of course, appropriate font sizes are important. You want larger titles for headings, smaller uh, fonts for um, the actual bulleted list and, and other uh, pieces of information. And we're, we're going to go into that a little bit more technically as well. Um, OK, so 
uh, let's look at an example of uh, some of these ideas here. Now, you may notice that I'm using myself as an example here. The reason I'm doing this is not necessarily out of vanity or anything like that. Uh, I'm using this as an example because this actually won an award at a conference um, for best poster. So uh, I, I use this just for that reason, not you know, a little disclaimer. Um, it was actually APA 2011 um, for Division Three, which is experimental psychology. Uh, so um, that's also, you know, going back to professional experience, right? If you go to a conference and you win uh, uh, a poster competition, that's great because, it, again, you can put that as a piece of experience that you have, which, again, alerts um, other people in the field and clients and so on and so forth about your uh, uh, expertise, that you are actually good at doing these things. So um, it's part content, but partly it's also about presentation. You have to present the important pieces of uh, information that, um, and, and not stuff that isn't important, right? So uh, one thing to note is that we've got background up here in the top left, right? That I, I, what I did was I consolidated the abstract and the introduction and just talked about previous work. And again, notice what I did was I have graphs here from previous work. So I'm not talking about what was found. It's a very specific piece of information that was pertinent to the study. Um, and then second, uh, there is a, a dedicated section for methods. Um, specifically looking at what the design of the study was, what the procedure was, and then um, what I was looking at is uh, uh, drawing accuracy, so the method of quantifying um, uh, the, uh, the errors that people made when uh, doing drawings. So uh, this is important because what, what this piece of information gives, like, hey, why do you need to get that detail, right? Well, the, the idea is that that was used to um, come up with the data that were analyzed in this main part of the uh, poster, which is the results, right? So the results take up this whole other section. So without knowing what is being analyzed, you don't really know what you're looking at. And again, it all ties back to this idea that as I'm describing this, point to what I did, right? And there's a visual aid so that people can understand exactly what it is that was done so that they can then interpret the graphs. Okay. Um, and then finally, you've got the discussion uh, down here on the on the bottom right, and then references. Uh, anytime you cite something, so up here, um, I don't know if you can see this, but I cite Sternberg 2005, and then Kelman and Garrigan 2009, and so uh, down here, those are, are listed. Um, and we'll see in a little bit how, how that factors in, because what you'll often have is a, what are called printouts. And then finally, you'll notice that there's this axis of symmetry, right? I've got from the beginning, this is one way of, of, of a theoretical approach to different um, issues dealing with this domain that I was interested in. And then down here, there is an alternative explanation for what happened in terms of my results. And so you'll notice that to the bottom left of this axis of symmetry, I've got the background and the method. And well, you know, sort of to the, to the right of it, you've got all the results. Um, it's not perfect, this is the way that I could fit everything, but still there is this distinction between you know, this, this part here which is background and this part here which is um, actually empirical results. So if you have your own data, um, you know, this is again an example, but you can think of it in terms of breaking it up by you know, what led up to the study and what were the, the actual um, results of the study. Now, if you have a, a research study that's in progress, that balance is going to shift a little bit, but you should still have something that talks about expected results, right? Okay, so this is one example. Um, I want to provide another, well, it's not really an example, but it's, uh, it's definitely important information, where there is a poster template that the Chicago School has developed. So um, in order to access it, there's this website uh, that you can um, actually, here, let me do this. Let me uh, go to this site, and what I'll do is I'll, um, I'll paste this into the chat box for those of you who are on the uh, actual call. That's the link. Now, um, you have an alternative. If you don't want to you know, be jotting all that down, you can always just go to uh, my.thechicagoschool.edu um, and go over here to Student Affairs. And then from Student Affairs, uh, over here on the left, there's Graduate Research Forum. And then uh, there's these there are multiple tabs up here. You go to this poster presentation resources one, 
and then you can download the TCSPP poster template. Um, and when you download that, what you get is this. Um, so you'll notice that this, this file has two pages, um, just a few instructions here. Uh, and then this is the actual poster itself. So here's where you have different um, areas of, uh, you know, each one of these is a, you know, a separate text box where you can insert a title and then text. You see that it's formatted in terms of bulleted lists. Um, so that's, again, harkening back to what I was talking about in terms of um, making things clear and concise. You can always move these things around. So don't, don't worry too much about that. Depending on your content, you may need fewer of these boxes. You may need more of them. Um, the point being that you have the, uh, uh, the necessary template from which to start work. Um, now, um, moving on, uh, the, whoops, hold on before we get to that. Um, oh, right, well, we want to talk about the, uh, the actual sections of a poster, but before we get to that, I want to make a note about um, the online graduate research forum. Um, the idea with the online graduate research forum is that it's a little bit different um, from the, uh, the on-ground sessions. Let me pause for a second because there's a question. Uh, this template is set for hard copy printing and digital media. Yes, um, it very much is. Uh, one thing that I want to point out later, but I might as well do it now since we're on the topic. Uh, if we go to this template, um, you'll notice I have this, the, the ruler up here, right? And it is, these are inches. So this is actually 52 inches by uh, 44 inches. And what that means is that if you were to print this out on one of those large format printers, it would look really sharp. Um, if you, for example, set this up as like an 11 inch by and a half inch poster, it would look the same on your computer screen. But then when you went to print it out by three to four feet, um, then it would look super blurry. And so you want to make sure that any time you're creating a, a poster like this, you have it set to those large dimensions. Um, another follow-up question looks like, does TCSTP have referral sources for us to print? No, I don't think so. But I can tell you that um, FedEx does this. Um, so you should call them. Uh, Staples oftentimes does this. So for about 50 bucks, um, depending on what kind of paper you want to use, whether you want to use color, so on and so forth. Um, the prices vary, so you can shop around a little bit. Um, and I believe there may or may not be funds for getting this reimbursed. Uh, if you get accepted to a conference, you can uh, apply for a bit of a stipend, so you can offset those costs. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Um, so for the online, it works a little bit different, right? You're not going to have a hard copy of a post that you're going to print out. Um, you can use the poster template, um, but what's going to happen is that it's all done through Canvas. So that's, that's what this, uh, this link here is. Uh, it's to the, uh, the quote-unquote course uh, in Canvas to which you can um, upload your presentation. But if you use the poster template for the online GRF, uh, you're going to find that that's potentially troublesome because if you have on a computer screen all that information that is normally three feet by four feet or more, and you're having it scrunched down to like, you know, a screen that's maybe on a laptop, which is 15 inches diagonal, mm, that's going to be kind of difficult. So um, another opportunity that you have is just to basically create more or less a PowerPoint presentation similar to what I'm doing right now. Um, the content would be the same, but you just have separate slides for the different sections as opposed to having different boxes on a poster for the different sections. So um, that way, you get sort of the best of both worlds, as it were. Um, I see there's another question coming in. Uh, I've seen some laminated posters. And then at my last conference, I saw just letter-sized papers pasted to the board. Well, yeah, then, then what you've seen is the entire spectrum of the different kinds of posters that people put together. I've even seen uh, folks who take um, literally fabric, and they have the fabric like screen printed so that they can fold it up, roll it up into a briefcase, and not have it uh, get bent or, or creased or ripped or anything like that, and done it that way. And I think that's a bit of overkill, but certainly, you know, a laminated poster, that suggests that somebody really went all out and, um, 
uh, you know, spent probably more than they needed to. Um, certainly, uh, the uh, the cost is an issue, but you want to make sure that when you're putting your poster together within PowerPoint or what have you, if you want to go black and white, you know, you want to make sure that uh, all of your graphs are going to show up as like, you know, discriminable. So you can use like a dark gray bar for one kind of group and a light gray bar for another kind of group, so on and so forth. Um, that's in fact what I did for this one. Um, you'll see that I used uh, dotted lines and solid lines um, and also had uh, darker gray lines for certain groups and lighter gray lines for other groups. In fact, here in the background, you see that I went even further and decided to put textures in one line versus uh, solid shapes for the other. So there's all kinds of tricks you could use and, and you know you see these high contrast uh, red um, ellipses which I use to highlight differences. So there's all kinds of tricks you could use as long as you keep in mind you know if I'm going to print this out in black and white uh, some things are going to show up differently right like this would look the same as this on a black and white poster so you know all things to keep in mind. Um, Another question, has anyone tried to project the poster or use tablet to present their posters? I've never seen that. Um, you certainly, I don't think there's anything stopping you from doing that if you want to lug a projector. The only issue there would be that um, if you can't plug in your projector, you might not be able to present. If you, if you find out ahead of time that that's possible, I think that would be a very inventive way to go about saving a couple of bucks on printing, definitely. Um, and can we use the very popular icons we see on smartphone apps? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question there. If you mean uh, including images that are copyrighted, that would be problematic unless you got permission to reproduce them. Um, but if it's like an emoji or you know something that's if you're doing research on you know app icons, certainly that would be appropriate. Um, but you know we can maybe talk about that offline. Um, the use of icons to represent a funnel, for example. Oh, yeah, sure, yeah, you can use those. You're talking about PowerPoint. Um, so, yeah, I think the question pertains to uh, if you're in PowerPoint, you have all these different types of, uh, where, where are they? Um, insert shapes, and there are uh, all kinds of other things that you could add, right? So, for example, flow charts, where are they? Smart art, there it is, right next door here. So you're talking about these things. Right, all kinds of like something like this. Right, you could insert things like this and have that in there. Certainly, that is appropriate. Um, some people choose to do it using these. You can always customize them. Right, you can always edit different things about. Uh, where's where's the little options? <clears throat> no. Format shape is it somewhere else on my screen? It probably is on my other screen here. Well, anyway, I'm not going to go crazy trying to find this, but there there should always be ways to edit these things. Um, well, you can definitely change the size, right? I'm not making that up. Uh, you'll have to forgive me. I just got uh, Outlet or PowerPoint 2016, uh, and so they may have changed this thing or two here. Oh, it's on the side. That's what they did. Okay, so it's no longer a pop-up. Okay, well, I just learned something. But see, you can change you can change things around over here apparently, right? So I'm changing the options here, transparency. Okay, great. Um, whatever kind of um, changes you want to make, um, so you can feel free to add those in. Yeah, glyph icons. Sure, we can call them that. <laughs> um, but okay, so I think I think that addressed that question. Uh, okay, let's go back to the slideshow. Um, okay, so this is where we were, I believe. Now, great questions, by the way. Keep them coming. Um, so next up, uh, talking a little bit more about um, the online GRF. Uh, it, again, it's a little bit different. Um, there was an email that was sent out by Ellen Grant on June 10th, so you should check that out if you're doing the online GRF. Uh, and um, again, it's all done through Canvas. So um, basically, you'll be able to uh, create 
a new discussion and discussion board, and then you title it with your name and poster title, and then you uh, make a first post where you upload your presentation uh, so that people can view it. Um, include your name, department, methodology, stage of research, three keywords and abstract in the um, uh, in the first post. Basically, this is the um, the abstract that you would have submitted uh, when you were first applying to present. Okay, now let's talk about the actual sections of the poster themselves, because this is where it gets really uh, into the um, uh, what, what to actually put into all, into all these boxes, right? So you want the title, the abstract, introduction, methods, results, discussion, acknowledgments, and references. So let's look at each one of these. So again, the, the online GRF presenters, you can have each one of these as a separate slide or have them all on one slide. I already mentioned what I think is the, uh, the option that I would use. Um, and these sections are similar to what you would do if you're putting together a paper, right? If you're putting together a journal article, for example, for publication, um, it's all the same information just presented in a different way. The title, um, 12 words or less, center aligned on the poster, um, and choose a large font. Um, it should be legible from far away. So if somebody's looking for your poster, you know, there's always a program. And so people are going to be like, okay, I need to go to row 12, poster E, right? But uh, they can also just by walking around see, oh, I'm looking for, you know, such and such uh, poster so they'll be able to find it. Um, you want to include the name, institution. Sometimes people include their department um, and also contact information. Uh, again, that's all on the, uh, the template here. You see that you've got the author names and their affiliations. Um, and let's see, you want to choose smaller fonts uh, than the title, but larger than text of body and poster. So this is talking about the author names and institutions. So it's like huge font for the title sort of medium font for the names and affiliations and contact information. And then for the actual content, you would have a, a third font. And again, you can play around with it to see what makes it look the best to you. Um, just always remember that it's going to be larger than what's going to be on your computer screen. So um, again, a technical note, if you were to go in here, you'll notice down here on the bottom right that this is zoomed to 18%. If you zoom to 100%, Again, remember, see now, now the scale is like one inch is one inch. So this is the size that when you print it out, this is the size of the title. This would be the size of the text of the affiliation, and this would be the size of the text. So if you're happy with how that looks, then you know that it's, um, that it's on the right track. Whereas if you're looking at it like this, okay, it might be kind of hard to judge what it would look like when it's full size in front of somebody in a physical space. Okay. Um, all right, so that's the title. Um, the abstract and introduction, we looked a little bit about, uh, we looked at this a little bit uh, when we looked at that example I showed you of my poster from APA. Um, but the, the general information you want to provide is what is being studied, right? What are we looking at? Um, you want to provide some theoretical background, um, highlight how previous research has informed the direction of the current study, so kind of tie your study in with what uh, led to it more or less from previous work, how you got to where you are now, um, and then list the hypothesis or hypotheses, so what is it that you decided to do upon getting to the point that you're at now, um, and all of these together should take up at most one-third of the poster, so you know, if we're looking at this kind of uh, you know, general outline, it would be the first of three columns, um, and again, you can decide how many of these boxes from the template uh, you want to use, but you know, uh, you have some flexibility. You can include them all. You can include subsections in one box or have three separate boxes. Again, whatever works, whatever you think is going to help you present it and make it um, appealing to the audience. Um, the method, right? So we know what you, uh, where you came from, what you decided to do next. How did you do it, right? That's what the method is all about. So you want to briefly describe the design of your study, identify how the phenomenon is being studied, and what this specifically means is you want to provide operational definitions. And operational definitions are more or less uh, in the, the, the instruments that you used, the criteria for inclusion in a group, so on and so forth. So if you, if you want to say, okay, well, um, I was interested in studying younger people, so I didn't include older people. Great. What do you mean older? Okay, so you would say, well, anybody below age X was excluded, um, and that's your operational definition of age. 
right? Or, or you know, old versus young, whatever. Um, and if you want to talk about things that were measured, you know, so if you're looking at something like depression, for example, you wouldn't say, okay, we measured depression. You would say we measured scores on the best depression inventory, right? Um, and so that's what I mean by operational definitions. You want to get specific so that somebody can know exactly what you did. Um, and then describe your sample or, or groups. Again, um, bulleted lists of you know, how many participants, what were the, demo, the pertinent demographic variables, so on. Uh, and you, again, only want to provide enough information to communicate the methodology, not the full detail. You know, you, you wouldn't say, okay, so we collected data between June 10th and June 20th of 2015, and, you know, we used, uh, you know, uh, this kind of um, response rate, whatever. It, you don't want to get too detailed. Um, I see a question came through. Uh, do you have a time frame within which to present the poster? Yes, you typically have one to two hours at a conference. At the GRF, uh, it's about an hour. Um, so, you know, it, it's going to be relatively quick. Um, but at the same time, you do maybe a five-minute presentation of the material to an audience that stops by. You know, they move on. They ask their questions. You interact with them for a couple of minutes. They move on to the next thing that they have on their agenda. You know, somebody else comes in a couple of minutes later, you do it again. Um, so that time frame will vary depending on a couple of different things, but usually, you know, you, you will present the same thing in a few different ways over the course of that hour or two hours, again, depending on the conference. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's move on to the discussion. So uh, towards the end of the presentation, you have uh, a summary, more or less, uh, followed by the importance or relevance of the findings. And um, you want to, again, tie your study into the rest of the field. So remember, at the beginning, you talk about, look, this is what the literature kind of pointed me to. And now that I know what my results were, how do those two really fit together? And if, if, if you're starting to see that they're coming together, great. You would write that up. Um, if there's some new contradiction that came up, you know, oh, that's interesting. You would then, you know, highlight that. Um, and this ties in this next piece, which is suggesting directions for future research and or practice. So certainly a lot of the work that you're going to be presenting is um, uh, going to have some applied value, right? So if you're looking at a new type of intervention, you want to talk about the implications for treating uh, whatever disorder or whatever um, area that you're interested in. And um, certainly this last piece is not to be ignored. You want to organize things in logical order. What I mean by this is within this section, you want to have things flow from one to the next, so that if you're using the poster as a visual aid, you can, you can kind of quickly glance at it and say, OK, now I know what I want to talk about. Boom, boom, boom. Everything is going to make sense. Uh, and also between sections. So the discussion should parallel the way that you present everything up till now. What I mean by that is, let's say that in the first um, section, the introduction slash background, you talk about point X, right? So here in the discussion, you want to talk about point X. And then in the, in the beginning, you talk about point Y after point X. Well, then guess what? In the discussion, you want to address point Y after point X again. And certainly the same thing applies to the, uh, to the results, right? If you talked about point X first and point Y second, then in your results, if that's what your results are showing, then okay, guess what? Point X should come first and point Y should come second. However you organize it, you know, left to right, top to bottom, first things first, second things second. And then all of those sections follow that same parallel uh, presentation format. Hopefully that makes sense. If not, you know, let me know. I'm happy to elaborate. Um, OK, finally, towards the end, you have uh, acknowledgments and references. So this is where you acknowledge anyone who has assisted but is not an author of the poster. If you're an author, that's plenty of acknowledgment, right? Um, but if somebody helped you with previous versions, if somebody, um, you know, contributed in some meaningful way to the work, then you want to acknowledge their input. Um, and you also, of course, want to list references of all the studies cited anywhere in the post. Remember, I showed you in the example that I uh, did for APA. Uh, I cited a few studies within, you know, different sections of the poster, and then at the end, you include uh, all of those in APA format. If you're running out of space, you can make the font of that a little bit smaller. Um, because only somebody who's going to be, you know, super, super interested is going to want to jot that down, right? And um, 
you should be able to, to have that ready for them. Okay, so next up, we've covered the sections. I want to talk very briefly about PowerPoint and how that can help. Um, PowerPoint has a few different tricks up its sleeve. Um, and I showed this already, right? The, the way to make the poster a different size. Again, if you make it, if you just open a PowerPoint, the default size I think is like uh, 14 by 11 inches or something, something small. Anyway, the idea is that you need to make the, uh, the page size larger. This is 2016, and again, uh, as I mentioned, it's a little bit different, but um, let's see, what does it say? <laughs> design, slide size, custom slide size. Okay, so you would go into design, and then all the way on the right here in 2016, you've got this, custom slide size. And then here, you see that this one is 56 by 45, right? Depending on the, um, the printer you want to use, uh, you can change this. So a lot of the time it's, again, 4 by 3 feet, which is 48 by 36. Um, for this template, it's 56 by 45, but you should find out, if you're going to an external conference anyway, you should find out what the, um, the required uh, poster size is and change it to that format. And then in previous versions of uh, PowerPoint, um, it's the design tab. You go to page setup and then width and height. So very similar, but um, they're just kind of shuffling things around as they update the different versions of PowerPoint. Um, again, like I, like I mentioned, this becomes important for printing. Okay. So next up, in PowerPoint, we use text boxes to insert content. So whether it's this, you know, you see that these are all text boxes within a PowerPoint slide. Uh, and each one of them has content. But uh, we know that there are better ways to, um, you know, present things so that they're aligned, so that everything fits nicely. And the PowerPoint gives you this really powerful tool called the snapping tool. So in older versions of PowerPoint, before 2016, in the Home tab, you would click Arrange, and then scroll down to Align, then click on Grid Settings, and then this box uh, pops up. Whoopsie. This box pops up. And then you would click Snap Objects to Other Objects. And what that lets you do, um, it allows you to uh, uh, basically set up the, uh, the boxes in a way that they'll align nicely as opposed to something like this. So um, that's a really nice feature. And you also want to make sure that you check this box, Display Smart Guides when shapes are aligned. And when you do that, when you drag shapes, they will literally like snap into position. And then when you move your mouse, it will kind of like stay snapped into position until you really like kind of move your mouse over and then it'll you know snap away. You don't always want to have that be the case. So um, you want to sometimes uncheck that option. So in previous versions of PowerPoint, you can add grid settings to your quick access toolbar. What I mean by that is what you know, you're basically doing one, you know, you click once, click twice, click three times, and then you get the piece of information you wanted. But if you go click once to align and grid settings and then you right click it on a PC, Anyway, you can right-click on a Mac, too. Um, you can add this grid settings to your quick access toolbar. And what that then means is up at the top, you'll have this little icon here. So then now you only have to click it once. And then that, uh, you know, that grid lines box will pop up um, immediately instead of having to go like, okay, fine. I have to click it like 12 times, and then I'll get it, right? Um, so again, sometimes you don't want to snap, and that will that will uh, help you do that. Now, in 2016, they got rid of this feature. So um, what you now do is you actually just right click in um, any empty part of the slide and then just go to grid and guides. So they've really um, see snap objects to grid. Um, there's that option. And display smart guides when shapes are aligned. This is where um, you can start to have that snapping feature. So right now, you see these like these red lines kind of show up. Oh, they disappear. Why is that? Well, that's because it's aligned with this shape up here, right? You see the edge of this shape and the edge of this shape are here. So when I pull this over, that red line tells me, okay, now they're snapped. And as I'm moving the mouse, you can't tell this is happening, but it's uh, it's helping me sort of know when it's snapped. And if I undo that, uh, display smart guides. Now I can more or less move it freely and it doesn't snap into position. So now I don't know, okay, now they're the, you see these two are not aligned, but if I change it to have these smart guides, now, oh, it snapped, and now I know it's aligned. So you're gonna avoid all of these problems, right? That looks nice and professional. 
Um, okay. So with that, I know we're kind of running into uh, our time limit here. Um, there's only a couple of other things I want to mention. If you have to go, it's okay because I'm recording this. You can always come back to the NK YouTube channel. Um, if you go to YouTube and just search for NK, that it'll show up. Um, but for those of you who have time, certainly stick around, and uh, we're we're nearly there. Reprints. Um, this is where uh, you can really make an impact because some folks will come to your post and say, "Okay, this is great. I'm going to forget this by the time my day is over. I'm going to be looking at a ton of these. I don't remember anything." You can print out a handful of these eight and a half by eleven copies and just have them to give out to people. You know, oh, you're interested here. Have have this, and people almost expect that. I've been to a number of conferences, and I can see that this is the pattern that exists out there. Um, so it's always good to have these uh, at the ready. You can also add a link in your poster so that somebody can instantly access your content. You don't have to have a hard copy, but if you have something like a QR code, people can scan it, or you can add a bit.ly link, somebody can jot that down, and then you can have a link to say Dropbox where you have a PDF of your poster and somebody can download it. So hard copies, digital copies, whatever the case may be, um, you can use these uh, as a way to you know, make sure that what you presented actually sticks in people's minds, right? Because without that, they're going to be like, oh, I remember there was something interesting, but what was it? Ah, whatever, right? But now this way, they have your name. They can refer back to that. And, you know, obviously you should have your cards with you if you have business cards. But um, in any case, th these are just uh, best practices, like I mentioned, based on, uh, based on experience, I can tell you that this is what people do. Okay, so um, let's just recap some of this. Um, the goals for external conferences and the GRF as well. Don't let's not discount the GRF. Within uh, internal conferences, you also gain really great experience by putting these things together, presenting them, and and, uh, and networking with folks. So again, you get to learn about relevant topics and teach people about interesting topics, uh, network with other experts, disseminate scientific findings, and you know bolster your uh, your CV. So none of that ever really hurt anybody. Uh, like I mentioned. Determining the fit of the conference will help you maximize value. So if you are interested in a very specific niche of research, there might be a conference for that. Um, things like APA, they have lots of different divisions. Um, but they also have uh, the benefit of each division being very specialized. So that might be a good venue. Um, for other folks, there might be a separate conference that is already uh, general, so to speak, within the field that you work in, and then within that you have even more specific specialization. So you know you should ask the TCS faculty. Um, you should look at mission statements of different organizations. Uh, look at previous convention archives. There's all well always is a strong word, but a lot of different conferences will publish their programs from previous years, and you can see at least the abstracts of what's been presented previously, and you can determine whether or not it is a good fit for your work. Um, and of course, you want to balance specific interest and general appeal. If you go to a conference that is so uh, you know, specialized that there are three people there, I mean, that's useful, right? But um, depending on your goals, you might want to balance that against uh, what would have more general appeal. But you know, that's a question that um, you'll have to sort of sort out. I'm just saying these are good ways to go about determining where to present. So like I mentioned, uh, APA has 56 divisions, each of which is uh, more or less specialized for a specific uh, branch of psychology. Um, and there's also the Western Psychological Association and the Eastern Psychological Association. So those are uh, regional um, APA uh, uh, conferences that you can go to, um, very similar formats. And you know, failing that, you can always use Google. Type in your topic and society or association or conference or convention. Um, and I, I just give this example. Um, there was a, I was interested in uh, art therapy at one point, and so I looked at okay, so art therapy, society, and convention. I just typed that into Google. Guess what? I found arttherapy.org. First link, more or less. Clicked on that. Turns out they had a conference going on in Minneapolis in July. This is this is last year, but anyway, the same thing holds. Um, you can very quickly uh, figure out what uh, what's going on where. And um, one of the thing is the 
the, the APA example I gave, what kinds of specific areas are there, right? Well, there are 56 divisions. They range in specificity. So some of them are called something like behavior analysis. Other ones are called um, something more specific. So for example, you might have uh, psychoanalysis, right, which is um, a type of uh, uh, therapeutic approach, right, which is different from um, a different kind of uh, therapeutic approach. So you've got all kinds of different areas, and not, not just content, but also a professional concern. So independent practice is another area, in, uh, another division of APA. So um, you can always find like, a good fit uh, within APA, but again, there may be more specific things that you could be interested in. The important point being to balance the quantity and quality. So you want to get a lot of people that will be interested, but you also want um, the right people to, to work with, to, to meet, to network with, etc. Um, and on that note, don't forget to look up the social hour. If they have a social hour, always a good time to, you know, just kind of talk to people and, uh, and mingle and uh, get some snacks and maybe a couple of free drinks there. Um, okay, so like I mentioned initially, if you're talking about poster presentation expenses, um, the Chicago School Student Association does have a reimbursement scholarship that you can apply for. Um, it can cover membership dues. A lot of conferences uh, require you to be a member in order to um, even be considered uh, for presenting. Um, there are often registration fees, there's travel, there's printing costs. Um, but contact your CSSA rep on campus for details. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the dollar amounts change um, from year to year. And there are also external sources of funding. So for example, APA, uh, 100 students every year receive $300 uh, towards um, whatever, and any one of these expenses. Um, so you should definitely look up uh, these different websites of these different organizations that you're thinking about presenting at and look for uh, funding sources from them as well. Okay, so to sum everything up, um, we're, we're really talking about something called the scholar, the scholar practitioner model. And um, the idea is that you find, teach, and learn from other scholar practitioners. So you're basically being um, introduced into this world within which you're going to be developing your career, right? Because everybody's always going to be working on things that are related to what you're working on. And you want to build a name for yourself and build your CV so that um, you can continue to learn over the course of your life and contribute to uh, the learning that other people do. And, and conferences are just a big way for people to do this. Um, and again, as, as I went through all these technical side of things, uh, you want to present information clearly and efficiently. So a poster presentation is the established format, and you can be creative within those constraints. So um, keep that in mind. You are uh, going to have your, your own style that you're going to develop. So whatever works for you, all of these are sort of guidelines, um, you know, best practices, like I mentioned. But uh, there is always this idea that people who are going to be coming to your poster presentation are going to have certain expectations. So you want to make sure that you fit within the general uh, framework that's, that's been presented here. And again, I want, to, I want to reiterate this. The poster itself is a visual aid. It's not a crutch. So you don't want to find yourself sitting there reading from the poster. You want to be you know, fluent in what's on the poster and be able to kind of go through it. So practice, practice, practice. Practice makes perfect, they say, right? Um, and presentation skills will be built from there. Some of you may already have experience, but if not, certainly uh, do practice ahead of time. Okay, so with that, uh, here's my contact info. If anybody does have questions later on down the line, I'm happy to uh, uh, chat with you via email, or you can call me number, um, or visit me. I'm in room 748 at the LA campus. Um, and again, I'm going to have this on YouTube. So uh, if you go to YouTube and search for NCADE um, and click on that, we have a bunch of different videos, but this one will be um, at the beginning because they're you know, sort of organized by chronological order. Uh, so with that, thank you for your attention and um, looking forward to uh, seeing some of you at the GRF.